to our teaching in the book of John. Now, the last time we were here, we were completing chapter eight with Jesus's teaching on himself being the light of the world, as well as speaking of himself as being the truth, the knowledge of the truth. Now, all of these things, whether the light of the world or knowing the truth, truth shall set you free, was all were, were nothing but statements concerning to have faith that Jesus was, or should I even say, is both son of God, divine being, as well as son of man, one who would give his life on the cross for sins. And in both of these things, in his preaching and teaching concerning being the light and being the one who sets free from sin, Jesus was simply saying to them, it is necessary for you to believe in what I am saying about myself in who that I am and what I will do in order to do what? Set you free, set you free from sin. And then the conversation went into the whole issue of origin. So go back and kind of take a look at what we were saying at that previous video in chapter eight. Always about origin because origin speaks of the divine nature of Jesus, one who pre-existed before he came into human form. That is, again, once again, John chapter one, in the beginning was the word, the pre-existence of the son of God. And then he continues on uh, with this whole issue about origin with the people about Abraham, the whole thing about doing the works of Abraham. Abraham is our father. God is our father. And the conversation went all the way up to when the Jesus simply said before Abraham was, I am. And this was a statement of divinity. And the people understood that Jesus was claiming himself to be God because they took up stones to stone him. And remember, the, the, the religious sin would be blasphemy to be a man and to say that you are God. And the penalty for such sin would be stoning. And that's how chapter eight ended with another declaration from the gospel of John supporting his premise supporting his premise. What? One and one in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh. It was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory of what? The glory of God in the flesh. And this is the very teaching of John's gospel. All right. So that's what we ended in chapter eight with this whole statement from the mouth of Jesus of his divinity before Abraham even existed, I existed in eternity past. So that's enough for that. <laughs> but we do continue on with such declarations from Jesus as John continues to build and support the premise of his gospel, the divine nature of Jesus with the healing of a man born blind in chapter nine. So without getting into anything further, because chapter nine is quite lengthy. And I think I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to try to complete all of chapter nine, even though it's lengthy, so that you can get a complete picture in one teaching about what's going on in chapter nine. So I think that's the best way to kind of accomplish this instead of breaking it up, because you may not be able to piece it all together because there are several threads in this particular teaching, or should I even say in this particular account of the man that is born blind, several threads, several points that you're going to see that are being made in the scripture, but one overall theme or thematic point that would be made in this text. Okay. So without anything further, let's just simply go into chapter nine. As he passed by, he saw a man born, a man blind from birth and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, 
I am the light of the world. Okay, now let's talk about that because immediately we are cast into some theology that we must deal with. So leaving the Feast of Booths is now past. John does not give us a particular time that these events happen, but John is simply using this event to support his claim of Jesus's divinity. Okay, so what, do, what happened? They meet a man, they're passing by, they see a man who was blind from birth. He had congenital blindness. He was actually born blindness. And so this created a theological question for the disciples. And so they address Jesus as rabbi, one who teaches. Rabbi, tell us why was this man born blind? Was it because of the sin of his parents or the sin of his own? Now, you have to understand that uh, from uh, first century Jewish thinking, uh, they are struggling here. They come to Jesus. They want Jesus to explain the man's blindness because they see his blindness as an act of divine judgment. That is, God is judging this man because of sin. So therefore, they're saying he's been judged of sin. But the conundrum, the problem is he was born blind. The man did not become blind from the womb. This man was born blind. So this creates a problem with their theology. So they want to know, was it because of the sins of the parents? Say, for instance, say for like Exodus chapter 20, when God says that he would uh, hold, he would count against upon visit the sins of the fathers upon the children. Now, we're not going to try to get into all of that theological definition, but basically he's basically talking about that which the parents do, the children would suffer for. The children are not suffering because they sin. They're suffering because of the sins of the parent. Say for instance, okay, I said I wasn't going to get into all of that, so I won't. But it is not simply saying, God was not simply saying he is punishing the children for the sins of the father. He is just saying that the children would suffer consequences because of their parents' sin. And that it makes sense. That just simply makes sense. If your parent is irresponsible and the parent has children, the children also suffer because of the uh, irresponsibility of the parents. And so Jesus, I'm sorry, Exodus 20 basically speaking to the consequences. But in the mind of the disciples, they're thinking about suffering for sin. So the parents did something wrong. And so now the child is suffering for it according to what they understood in the scriptures. Then he says, so is he suffering for the sin of the parent? The second question, if it's not the sin of the parents, is it because of the sin of the man? Again, we are left with another conundrum. If the man is born blind, how can he have done any sin? This takes us back to rabbinical and pharisaical. This is the teachings of the Pharisees for that time. They believed that if a, a child was able to sin in the womb. Okay, let me just take, take you through it. They believed that children were born with certain inclinations, an inclination to do good, to be good, an inclination to do bad or to be bad. They believe that usually the inclination to do good won over. But however, in the time that the inclination to do bad won over, then the child would be born bad. And, and while the child was yet in the womb of the mother, the child should kick the mother in some sense of animosity towards his mother. The child kicks the mother and in judgment, God blinds the child. The child is born blind. So they believe that a child in the womb could actually commit sin and suffer the consequences for his own sins. So this answers the question or deals with the conundrum. Was it the parents who sinned that caused the child to be born? Or was it as the Pharisees who, uh, who taught that the child could kick the mother and be born blind? Was this the case? Why then is this child, this man, why was he born blind? And this was what they were asking Jesus. 
And Jesus responded. Now note the response of Jesus. And I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but it is something that is absolutely remarkable to consider. So Jesus says, neither was the case. The man was not born blind because of sins of his parents, and neither was the man born blind because he sinned, but that the works of God may be made manifest in him, may be displayed in him. What was Jesus saying? Jesus was saying that the man was born blind in order that what God would do through Jesus on that day to this man born blind, God would receive glory. Okay, let me slow that part down because I really want you to see it and I really want you to get the gravity and import of what Jesus was trying to say. Jesus was literally saying, God made that man to be born blind so that that day Jesus would come and heal him and therefore show forth the glory of God. God blinded that man for this specific occasion to the which Jesus would heal him. Now, I don't want to just hammer on that, but think about what the Lord is saying. He is saying, clearly this man is not young because later on, as we move through this particular story, we're going to find out that the man was of a significant age to understand many things. In other words, he was a grown man. He was a full grown man. And this man from the day of his birth suffered blindness. He could not see by the predetermined will of God. God said, I don't want you to ever see. So for days upon days upon days, it was the sovereign will of God the Father that this man should not see until Jesus come to heal him. Now that's an amazing concept. And what are we, what are we learning here? We're learning about the sovereignty of God. Sovereignty simply means, and this is one of my pet peeves, and nothing excites me and makes me fear God and glorify him at the same time as I consider such things like this. Sovereignty simply means God does what he wants with what is his and tell me what is his. The whole doggone universe belongs to God. The world is mine and the fullness thereof. Those who sin, those who don't, it's all mine, says the Lord. And what? I am the potter and you are the clay. God does what he wants when he wants and he doesn't have to answer to anybody. Everything serves the purpose of our almighty and sovereign God. If he chooses to make you blind from birth so he can tell a story, he does that. And okay, and that's enough of that. That's enough of that. So let us all understand the point of these things and understand the point of this principle. Let us all submit to the will of God. And even if you don't submit, so what? He does what he wishes. Isn't that what even Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king, says? Who can say to him, what doest thou? Why are you doing it? Who can stop his hand from accomplishing his own will? None of us. None of us. But, okay, 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 okay. I just wanted you guys to understand how powerful what Jesus was actually saying there. That God made this man blind so that Jesus could show up one day at a predetermined day, even this day, to do what he will do to open his eyes. And then Jesus continued on and says, now notice, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day that the night is coming when no man could work. Notice he said that we may work. He is including himself as well as his disciple in doing the work of God while Jesus is still alive. So this is, this is about doing the will of the father before the cross. And this is what Jesus is looking at. Why? 
the night is coming. And that's speaking of Jesus's death up unto his resurrection. Okay. Death and resurrection in that particular period in time. This is the night when no man works. Why? Jesus himself will no longer be continuing his work of evangelism and his disciples will temporarily not be working in evangelism. This is a part of the night. Remember what happened when Jesus rose from the dead? What did Peter say? Peter says, I'm going back to fishing. I'm going back to my normal employ. The work had ended for the moment until Jesus put him back on the job. And that's what he means by the night. So he has to continue to do the will of the father until the appointed time of his death. And that's what he means by we. So me, me, the Lord Jesus, and you, my disciples, must continue in this work until the time of my crucifixion. All right. So now let's continue. Uh, oh, sorry. Verse number five. While I am the while I'm, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And, and that speaks for itself going all the way back to John chapter one and Jesus himself declaring himself what we just read even in John chapter eight. I am the light of the world. <laughs> so there's a reflection back to that as well. But the point is, it is faith in him, belief in him, trust in him that a person, and we'll see that too. What does light do? Light gives, enables such a one to see. And what is the whole idea? The man is born blind. The man will be able to see. Faith in Jesus enables, enables such a one to see the truth, to see God, to be saved. Jesus is that way unto salvation. He is the light of the world. And so therefore, while he is still here, he will shine. All right. <laughs> Verse number six. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the one, it's me. So they were saying to him, how then were your eyes opened? He answered, the man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes. And he said to me, go to Shalom and wash. So I went away and washed and I received sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. All right, let's deal with this section. So Jesus making them aware, being the light of the world, that he must work the works of him. He made his disciples aware clearly that he was going to heal this particular blind man. Now, before we get into this, uh, the text of the actual miracle sign, a sign that is actually done because this is not just a miracle. It is a sign. It attests to something. Remember, the whole idea of a sign is to speak of to the one who has done this thing. It says something about him and it speaks to the verity, the truthfulness of what he is saying. And that's why it's called a sign. When you do these things, what Jesus is saying about himself is the truth. The thing that Jesus is preaching is the truth. What is Jesus saying about himself? He is God. He is the son of God. He is the son of man who gives his life for sin. So therefore, by doing these signs, these signs, by the activity of these signs, it is attesting. It is proof that what he says is the truth. OK, but about this particular sign miracle that Jesus did, this this was one of the three inclusive in the New Testament, which were considered by the Jewish people as messianic signs okay or messianic miracles what do i mean when i say that miracles had been done 
by the prophets of the Old Testament. You can read that. And miracles were even being done, not great miracles and great substantive miracles, but even miracles like casting out demons. Remember when they accused Jesus of casting out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons? And Jesus responded to them, if I, by the spirit of Beelzebub, cast out demons, then who do you say your children cast out demons? So in other words, demon, demon casting out demons was even being practiced by those who were other people than Jesus, okay? So miracles were being done, but not great substantive miracles during the time of Jesus, but such things like casting out demons. And of course, substantial miracles were done by the prophets of the Old Testament. What is meant by a messianic miracle was, this was such a miracle that the people believed that only the Messiah could do. Only the Messiah could do such a miracle. So therefore, whatever man did one of these particular miracles, this was the proof that he was the Messiah because only the Messiah could do such a thing. Now, of these miracles, there were basically three that we see recorded in the New Testament, which were considered to be messianic miracles. Number one, Casting out demons from a person who uh, could not speak, that is a dumb demon. Now, I don't want to get into all of the details, but the idea is when the Jews would cast out demons, the first thing that they would do to get authority over the demon was to discover his name. And that's why they asked, what is your name? Once they, un once they acquired the name of the demon, by the name of the demon, they would exercise authority over the demon to cast him out. So they needed to ask the demon's name. The note, but notice, like for, for example, in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus, there would be a man who could not speak and would be brought to Jesus. And when brought to Jesus, you couldn't get the name. Jesus couldn't get the name of him because he couldn't speak. The demons had control of his vocal cord, but nevertheless, Jesus cast the demon out anyway. And the people began to marvel in amazement, asking, could he be the son of David? Could he be the Messiah? Again, they recognized this was a messianic miracle. Then another one was the healing of, of men with leprosy. They believed that only the Messiah could heal those who were born of leprosy. We see that with Jesus healing, healing people with leprosy on a number of occasions. And we can also see Jesus testifying to this, that he is the Messiah who could only do this when he would send the men back to the priest to show themselves, not only in obedience to the law of Moses, but as a testimony that the Messiah indeed is here and it is Jesus. So the second one would be the healing of people with leprosy. And then the third messianic miracle that we have recorded in the New Testament is the healing of a man born blind. And this is the occasion where we are now. This man was born blind and because they believe, here's the idea now, especially the Pharisaical beliefs, that this man had sinned even from the womb. Only the Messiah could heal him of this blindness. Okay, so this is what we call a messianic miracle. This, that's why we call it a sign. It is a testing. Jesus is simply saying, you believe, and notice even the man born blind is going to say later on at the end of this text, it has never been heard in all of the ages that a man born blind was healed. It was heard that a man was healed of his blindness when he was born with sight, but never when he was born blind. But anyway, we'll, get, we'll deal with all of that. So again, I'm just laying the foundation that this is a messianic miracle, one believed to be done only by the Messiah. All right. All right. So what happens now? Let's look at the occasion of the healing in verse number six through twelve. So Jesus spat on the ground and he made clay of the spittle and put it to the man's eyes and told him to go to the pool of Siloam and wash and then he would be healed. So Jesus made spittle. What we have to understand, and it is clearly, 
clearly being evidenced in the text that as God, because this is the whole idea. And as we get to the end of John chapter nine, we're going to see again, John, John uses this miracle to support Jesus is God. Why? Only God can do these things. But we'll talk about all of that as we work through the text. But what is being clearly implied is the work of God in creation. Why? When we go back to Genesis, what do we see? We see God taking from the clay of the earth and making man. What do we see here with Jesus? Jesus using his own spittle, his own spittle, making clay and anointing his eyes. So it takes us back to the formation of man. But here it is not going to be the formation of the whole man. It's going to be the formation of his eyes, of his eyes. Only God can make a man. Only God can make eyes. But anyway, so that's the inference that we see. And Jesus simply tells him, go to the pool and wash. Now this by going to the pool. So why is he sending him there? Number one, his act of faith, the, 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 the presence of his faith will be evidenced in his obedience. Okay. Jesus loves to work alongside of a man's faith, but nevertheless, it was not necessary for the man to have faith. Jesus had already set his mind to heal this man, but quite, but it is quite obvious as we work through the text that indeed the man has faith. But in going to the pool of Shalom and returning, the man becomes visible to everyone else. In other words, the, the sign miracle that Jesus did will begin to get the attention of the people. This man is born blind. He has to get someone to lead him to the pool of Shalom. There'll be witnesses. And as he comes back from the pool of Shalom, all of a sudden, when he gets there and washed, all of a sudden he sees, he starts to come back. People are going to pay attention to him. So all of this is done to garner the attention of the people and, uh, and ultimately Ghana, as we'll see, the attention of the religious leaders is going to force them into a decision, is going to force them to consider these things that Jesus is doing and consider, therefore, who is Jesus? Who really is he? Is he who he has been claiming himself to be? But anyway, without getting all of that, let's just go on. So he just simply goes, he obeys, watch, he comes back seeing, and quite naturally, the, he gets the attention of the people. So those people who knew him, they knew that, remember, as a, a, a man born blind, he could never work, so he had to do what? Beg. He would constantly sit and beg. And this became, by him begging, he became known to the people. So those ones who had knew him saw him coming back and saw that he was able to see, and they would say, well, what is going on? Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? How is he able to see? And so is this truly him? And so some were saying, well, no, this can't be him. And then some people said, I don't know. He looks like him, but I'm not sure. But the man kept saying to them, it's me. Yes, the man was self-identifying. <laughs> yes, it is me. I am the one who was born blind. And so quite naturally, they asked, well, how were your eyes open? And this was the point that God had intended, Jesus said. This man was not born blind because of the parent's sin or his sin, but that the works of God might be done upon him. This is what Jesus, why Jesus said what he said and did what he did as well as God. So that the people may begin to ask who has done this significant miracle. We know you were born blind. Who did this? The musing would be, it has to be the Messiah. What? Only the Messiah could heal a man who was born blind. And so notice again, then the man answered, what? The man who is called Jesus 
made clay, anointed my eyes, and he sent to me, told me to go to Siloam and wash. And so now I come seeing at this time. And so they said, well, where is this Jesus that you said? The man said, I don't know. But let me tell you what I want to talk about here. He said, when they asked him about who opened his eyes, notice his reference to Jesus. Now, I'm not going to be premature at all because I have a bad habit of getting into stuff before I actually get to the text. But what I want to make you aware of is this man's progression of faith. This man's discovery and understanding of who Jesus is. This man's not only his physical eyes being opened, but by the grace of God, his spiritual eyes will become open. And see, that's a part of the theme that's running through chapter nine, which is also one of the reasons why I wanted to cover the whole chapter in one video so that you can see that thread that is woven throughout of the spiritual points that God is trying to speak about this man. Not only were his physical eyes opened, but his physical eyes. So the first thing that we see, notice what he says about Jesus here. Notice what he says. The man, the man called Jesus. Okay, so that's the thing. How does he understand Jesus? He understands Jesus simply to be what? Say it with me. A man. A man. That's how he understands him. And then, of course, he told him the ma the manner in which Jesus healed him by the making of clay, anointed as I with clay, sent him to Shalom. He came back. He was able to see. Another thing that we need to understand, too, is the making of the clay. Now, we'll talk about that even more in the text. Two things, the, the, the uh, healing of the man and the making of the clay. They are going to be important as we move through the text, okay? But we're not going to talk about it yet. We're not going to be premature. But what is important here is the blind man, his progression of faith, all right? From faith unto faith. But we'll show you what that means later on. So the people began to wonder, they began to ask the man, well, where's this Jesus whom you said that healed you? And the man just simply said he didn't know Jesus had not revealed himself at this time, but he is going to, he is going to, okay? Remember the man was blind, but he was aware that it was a man by the name of Jesus. Let's continue. Verse 13. Now they brought to the now they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. See the two? Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight, and he said to them, He applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. <laughs> okay, let's talk about it. So remember, this is what a messianic miracle. The people are so astounded by the miracle. I don't think it was for negative reasons that the people took the man to the Pharisees. Possible, John doesn't say it, but he just simply says the people took this man who had received such a grandiose miracle within himself. He was born blind. Nobody could do such a thing, and Jesus did, so they take him to the Pharisees. And then notice what it says in verse number 14. Here's the key. Here's the negative part. It was the Sabbath day. Now, what's important about that? The Pharisees, in their additional rules concerning the Sabbath, remember the whole idea of God was to simply rest on the Sabbath day. But the Pharisees created all of these additional rules concerning the Sabbath day. One of the rules was that healing on the Sabbath day was not permissible 
Healing on the Sabbath day was not permissible as well as the making of clay would not be permissible because it would be considered as work, work. So the Pharisees considered healing as work and especially Jesus doing what? Making clay. So we can see a dual reason for Jesus making of the clay. What? Not only does it display back to Genesis act of God in creation, create God created man from clay, Jesus creating eyes from clay, doing things like God that only God can do. So that's number one. So we see that in the making of the clay and also too in the Sabbath. Remember Jesus and one of the reasons why they hated him and wanted to kill him is because he did not support the Pharisaical rules of the Sabbath. Jesus supported the biblical rules of the Sabbath. What the law of Moses actually taught about resting on the Sabbath. All of these additional rules of the Pharisees, Jesus rejected and they hated him for that and wanted to kill him because of that. And so now we can see why the scripture is saying it was the Sabbath day that Jesus what? Healed what the Pharisees call work and made clay. And the Pharisees truly called that work on the Sabbath. They rejected the messianic miracle itself, healing a man born blind because of their rules of working, of working. Indeed, now notice again, and I don't want to be premature. I always have that habit, but listen to me even here. Notice how blind the Pharisees are. You see how all of this blindness and blindness and blindness is working in this story. But anyway, okay, not going to get excited because I'll start skipping stuff. But so the Pharisees made the assessment because Jesus did those things on the Sabbath day. They simply said, this man cannot be of God. In other words, they are already, they've already, they have already rejected him as a Messiah. So even though Jesus has done a notable messianic miracle, a miracle that says he is the Messiah, they still reject him because of their rules of what Jesus is doing on the Sabbath day. And, but others amongst the Pharisees were thinking to themselves saying, now wait a minute here. He has done, that is Jesus, a most notable sign. How in the world, if he is a sinner, can he do this? And so there became, there was existing a division amongst the Pharisees. So, None of them, well, some of them were believing, okay, but I don't want to get in all of that. But what we're simply showing is in the council of the religious leaders, namely the Pharisees, there was a division, a division. It's like, you know, it's hard to just simply to say he is a sinner. It's hard to say that because this man keeps doing some things that only the Messiah could do when others were just adamant, simply saying he is a sinner. I don't care what he says. I don't care what he does. All right, let's go on. And so they asked the blind man. All right, fine, 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 fine. We got issues here. We'll keep that to ourselves. But tell us, you tell us, Mr. Blind Man, since you were the man born blind and you were the man that he healed, you are the man that he healed. What do you have to say about Jesus? Who do you say that he is? What do you say about him? And notice the response of the blind man. Now, you're already ready for what I'm about to say. Let's go back earlier. When Jesus healed him, remember what the people, the neighbors who saw, saw the blind man heal, what did they say? What did, he, what did the blind man say about Jesus? The man, the man. Now, as he's gone to the Pharisees, he's had some time to think about this thing. And now the Pharisees are saying, who do you say that Jesus is? What do you say have to say about him? And he begins to say, now, he's not just simply a man. He has to be something great. He is a prophet. He is. A, so notice we see what a progression of what this man is thinking and believing about Jesus. He's no ordinary man. 
He has to be something special. This man, this blind man, man born blind, he has time to think about it and reflect about it. And in reflecting about it, he's reflecting on the person just who Jesus must be. So he said, well, he must be something. He, so if he is a prophet, he ain't no sinner. That's clear. If he is a prophet of God, he is a godly man. That's the assumption number one. But he is even more than just a godly man. He has and he shares a greatness like Elijah. He is a prophet, one who has done a mighty deed because he is indeed sent from God, a prophet. But notice the progression of the man's faith. Let's continue on. Verse number 18. The Jews then did not believe it of him that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight and questioned them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes? We do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. All right. Round number two. So what happened? The Jews, the Pharisees, rejected what the man had said about Jesus. Remember the whole thing. How did he open your eyes? And it's the, the, what really kind of gets their goat. The man saying he is a prophet. But it makes it so hard to come, go against what the man has said because of the miracle. It's hard to do that. So they have to find some way to attack. In other words, well, you know. This is not a messianic miracle. The whole idea of messianic miracle. Only the Messiah can heal a man born blind. Born blind. And who would know more so if this man was truly born blind other than the parents? So they are attacking the very nature, the nature of the miracle itself. In other words, if we can prove, if we can prove this man was not born blind, then Jesus healing of this man would not be messianic. Why? If the man is only the Messiah can heal of a, a person born blind, but a person can heal a person who is blind and did not have to be the Messiah if the person was not born blind. So as long as the person is not born blind, then it's no claim to the Messiahship. Because notice that's what we get to that at the very end of it, being the Christ. We'll talk about that, but let me just work it through. So what happens? Round two. So they call the parents because they're trying to squash this whole issue of the man being born blind. And they begin to ask the man, well, is this your son of whom you claim? See, notice that. See the attack? You claim what? He was born blind. That's the attack. He was not born blind. They're trying to get to that. And so the parents, you can imagine how they are nervous against these religious leaders and the power and the influence that these religious leaders had over them and over their religious lives. And we'll see that at the end of this particular section. They answered in the affirmative. affirmative. Yes, this is indeed our son. So that's true. And in the affirmative, yes, indeed, he was born blind, just like he is saying. But here's what we don't know. We are ignorant of this. But who healed him and how he healed and all of this stuff? We have no idea. Our son is a full grown man and he is able to speak and answer these things for himself. So if you want to find out about the rest of it, ask him. And so the parents, and this is a nervous response from the parents, and they're getting, they're getting out of this mess. They don't, they're not trying to avoid uh, 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 their son in any way, but they notice what he just said here. Let me just deal with that. The, the Pharisees had already said that if anybody were to confess Jesus 
as the Christ. That is, to remember, whenever you see Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. And that's what this whole thing is all about. That if anybody should confess Jesus as the Messiah, put him out of the synagogue. Your fellowship with the Jewish people has now come to an end. No more religious fellowship with you. And so this is what they were afraid of, having their religious life and their connection of being ostracized by their own people because of a judgment from the religious leaders. Do you understand that? The religious leaders say, you are no longer a member of the Jewish community. Out you go. And in doing that, you lose your identity altogether as a Jew. That's what they were trying to say. And even we can see this even being done to Jews who believe in Jesus to this day. They are ostracized from the Jewish community and are considered to be no longer Jews. But so you understand that. So you can see why the parents responded. He is of age. Ask him because all of this has to do with messianic claims. That's why Jesus said the man was not born blind because of sins, parents or himself, but that the works of God might be done through him. That the proclamation, the understanding, the uh, undeniable claim of Jesus. He is the Messiah. He is the son of God. He is God in the flesh. This is why this man was born blind. And this is what the Pharisees are fighting, fighting against with all of their might. So, okay, again, let, let's go on. So I won't be so unnecessarily long. So this is the whole issue. Round two in bringing the parents. They want to, 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 to remove any idea of the man being born blind. And if the man is not born blind, then the miracle is not messianic. And therefore Jesus, his sign, the miracle will not attest to him being the Messiah. People will not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And again, they have warned people. And if you go about claiming that this Jesus is the Messiah, we will excommunicate you. OK, so this is the idea. Round number three, 24. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give God, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He then answered whether he is a sinner. I do not know. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. So they said to him. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? They reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. Don't you like that? Okay, okay. Round three. So again, they bring in the blind man and they're trying to just simply destroy him and destroy any attempts that Jesus might be recognized as the Messiah. So they brought him in for the second time and notice what they said. Don't be thankful to Jesus. Don't think that begin to praise Jesus as being the Messiah. Don't begin to praise Jesus as being the coming one. No, 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 no. Just don't worry about Jesus at all. You give glory to God. Just thank God for what has happened to you. Why? Because concerning Jesus, we reject him as the Messiah. Jesus is not who you might think he to be because you just called him a prophet. And Jesus is not what the people may be beginning to think Jesus is and they bringing you to us. We know that this Jesus is a sinner. Our decision concerning him is he is not of God. He is a sinner. We don't care what he has done. We don't care how it may look. 
the messianic miracle, the miracle that only the Messiah can do. We don't care about none of these things. We reject him, but nevertheless, we cannot reject the miracle. And that's the thing that's getting them. They can't reject the miracle. Why? The man was born blind. His parents have testified he was born blind. The people, the neighbors who knew this man have testified he was born blind. They cannot deny the miracle. So what do they do? They just simply reject Jesus and say, well, just praise God for the miracle. So what does the man answer? The man say, mm, now, whether he be a sinner or not, I do not know. The man is not saying, I, I, don't, I, I'm, I, don't, I haven't made up my mind about whether Jesus is a sinner or not. That's not what he is saying. He is simply saying that what you are saying about him to, as to being a sinner. <laughs> I don't really agree with that. Now, that's really what the man is trying to say. Why? Because, first of all, remember, the progression of faith, don't lose that, the progression of faith of the blind man. At first, he called Jesus what? Simply the man. Then he referred to Jesus as what? A prophet. So you have to be not only a godly person, but a special godly person into which God has used you in a unique way to be considered as a prophet. So the man is not agreeing, simply saying, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. He's just simply kind of saying it in a euphemistic and non-offensive way to the Pharisees. He knows of the threats of the Pharisees. He knows of the power of the Pharisees and what they can do to him. But anyway, so he just simply says, well, he a sinner like you say. I don't know about all of that. But this is the one thing that is undeniable. Wherein once I was blind, now I see. So the undeniable fact is the man is saying he healed me. And as we move through the text, we're going to understand that the man never was in indecision as whether Jesus was some kind of a sinner, like the Pharisees says. We'll see that as we move through the text. But anyway, uh, so they said to him again, I'm at verse number 26 again, as the interrogation continues, they keep asking him to try to find something loophole or some way to condemn the man, to condemn Jesus, condemn the miracle, reject it. How, tell us one more time. Tell us one more time. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And then that's when the blind man begins to be impatient. <laughs> and he said, and not only is the blind man beginning to be impatient, his courage, his courage. What did I just say? His courage is beginning to grow. He says what to them? I've told you already and you didn't listen to me. Why do you want me to rehearse it to you again? Why do you want me to tell it to you again? Are you now considering, if I tell you again, are you considering that you might become his disciple? Are you going to be his disciple too? So <laughs> he knows that they will not. He knows that this will offend them. But what he is doing is he is defending Jesus. And also he is implying what he himself, the blind man is becoming or has become a disciple of Jesus. You see the progression of faith from calling him what the man then saying what a prophet and then bringing in what the issue of being a disciple. Notice, you are going to be a disciple as well, too, like me. And you're going to see that as you work through the text. So in simply saying or even suggesting to the Pharisees that they would be a disciple of Jesus, they find this detestable. It is bitter gall in the mouth that sours on the belly and burns their ears. And notice what it says that they did. When, when he said that to them, they reviled him. In disgust, they began to hurl uh, 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 negative things to him and saying bad things about him. Notice, they said, you are his disciple. You see that? They understood that when the man said, why you want me to tell you again? 
Do you want to become his disciples too? They understood that the man was considering himself now a disciple of Jesus. So what do the, the Pharisees say? You are his disciples, but we are disciples of Mo They make a sharp contrast between themselves and the man. We are disciples of Moses. You believe in this shenanigan of a prophet that you think is the Messiah, but we are disciple of Moses who we know was a one truly a prophet and one truly sent from God. As far as this shenanigan, jack leg, no good Jesus, you are his disciples, but we are legitimate. We are true disciples of Moses. Then what happened? We know, notice what he said. We know that God has spoken unto Moses, but as to just Jesus, we don't know where he's from. Again, we know that Moses indeed is of God. Moses indeed was a prophet and we know that God spoke to Moses, but all this crap that Jesus is saying about himself, that he comes from God, that he speaks the word from God, that he comes from the father and all the things that he does is what the father has given him to do. We don't know anything about that. We can't verify any of that. We believe in Moses, we trust in Moses, and we know that Moses is an authentic prophet of God. But as Jesus, his origin, remember what we've been saying. If you notice, we've been saying all through these videos, all through the videos, how it always devolves. It always what devolves into this issue of Jesus's origin. Why origin? Have you been following me in the videos? Why the origin? Because Jesus declared his pre-existence to pre-exist before his time of birth, before Abraham was, I am. You're declaring something about yourself, that you are God. They rejected what Jesus was saying about himself. So as far as this Jesus, who he truly is and where he is truly from, we reject what he has been saying about himself. We don't know where he come from. We don't even know who his real parents are. Joseph says that he was, but you know what? We heard his mother was pregnant before Joseph actually officiated the marriage. We heard that. We don't know anything about this true Jesus and what they reviled him. All right, let's bring this to a close. Where am I? Where am I? So now, uh, 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 they are, <laughs> they're tearing the blind man out the frame. <laughs> he came in for interrogation because of a messianic miracle. The Pharisees, they just won't reject. They reject it. They kind of twist it because they're, they're, they're conflicted because Jesus has done the messianic miracle and not remember. They already seen how Jesus healed, uh, People with leprosy, messianic miracle. They've already seen how Jesus has uh, cast out the demon from a man who could not speak. Another messianic miracle. And now Jesus opened up the eyes of a man born blind. Messianic miracle. And it's like, oh my God, oh my God. He keeps doing this stuff. Is he what he says he is? But ultimately, they said, no. No, he is not. They have come to a point of rejection. rejecting him. Now, there are some who are secretly believing in him, but they won't say anything. We'll talk about that when we get to it in John. But anyway, uh, let's continue on. We don't know who, where he is from. Now that's where they stop. We don't know anything about him. We don't know where he's from, blah, 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 blah. So now continuing on with round three, the blind man further encouraged, he takes even more strength and begins to defend Jesus. The man answered, verse number 30, and said to them, well, here is an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, 
You were born entirely in sins. And are you teaching us? So they put him out. <laughs> okay, let's bring it to a close. We're getting near. Let's say it that way. So the man answered. The man is continuing to talk. He said, now this is an amazing thing. You are feigning ignorance. You're saying you don't know what the man is. You don't know where Jesus has come from. And you don't know who he is. And you don't know whether he's the Messiah. And you think that he is a sinner. You say to me, he is a sinner. And only to give glory from God. But isn't it an interesting thing that what? Number one, we know that God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 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 We know that we know that God does not hear sinners. Okay, let me stop there. Notice, we know. The blind man says, I know it and you know it too. What do we all know? That God does not hear sinners. So he is simply saying, but when Jesus did what he did, clearly it was evidence because I gained my sight that God heard him. So if Jesus was a sinner, God would never have heard him and opened my eyes. But if anyone is God fearing and does what God does, the will of God, God does hear him. So the blind man just simply says here, you call Jesus a sinner. And I am saying to you, by the evidence of him opening my eyes, he cannot be a sinner because if he was a sinner, if he was a sinner, then God would not have heard him and opened my eyes. Then he continued on. He is built. He's stronger and stronger and giving evidence upon evidence, even of the messianic miracle itself. Notice what the blind man says. Even from the beginning of time, it has never, ever been heard such a marvelous and powerful and unique miracle like the one that I received upon my eyes. That a man who was born blind should be healed, should receive his sight. This has never happened in the beginning of time. So the blind man is simply saying this notable miracle is proof that Jesus must indeed be a righteous man. You got it? If he were not from God, he couldn't do this thing. He could do nothing. So he is simply saying, number one, the miracle is the proof that Jesus is not who you're claiming him to be. The miracle is the proof that Jesus is indeed a prophet. I'm sorry, a righteous man in the least, in the least, he is a righteous man, but I believe he is a prophet, like I just told you. So when the blind man got through teaching them in that sense, got through speaking to them, let me say it like that now, <laughs> saying what? That number one, we know what? We know that God does not hear a sinner. And number two, what? It has never been seen in all of time, the miracle done to me by anybody. When the blind man got through speaking to them, they became even more offended at him. Why? Here you are. Let me say it like this. Let me, can I say it like this? Here you are. You're ignorant. You're dumb. And you were born blind. And now we, the Pharisees, we who are disciples of Moses, we who know the law, are you now going to try to, how, you ain't in no shape to teach us. You are not able to teach us. You are not qualified to teach us. And they threw him out. And that word for they, they put him out is the word ekbalo, meaning to cast him out, to forcefully throw him out. They threw his behind out of there. You ain't, you ain't in no shape, man, to teach us. Get out of here. They were absolutely offended in him as this man defended Jesus as best he could before the Pharisees. But let me tell you something else they said before we move on to the next section. Notice they said to him, <laughs> you were all together born in sin. In other words, remember, what did they try to contest about the man? 
He was not born blind. Remember, that's why they brought the parents in to try to refute the fact that he was born blind. But since they could not, they could not refute the fact that the man was born blind, they had to accept it from the parents and the people. They had to accept the testimony. He was indeed born blind. But remember what the teachings of the Pharisees were about a person born blind. To be born blind meant that you sinned in the womb. You sinned in the womb and you had an inclination to possess an evil nature. You were born a sinner. You were born a sinner. So what did they say to him? Because he was born blind, as they refuted, they were angry because the man called himself teaching them, man, you were born in sin. How in the world is a joker like you literally born in sin from the womb? How do you think you are qualified to teach us? You can get up and get out. <laughs> so they threw him out all right let's continue let's bring it now to a close verse 35 what were the end results of all of these things Jesus heard that they had put him out and finding him notice Jesus found him finding him he said do you believe in the son of man he answered who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and he is the one who is talking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into the world, to this world, so that those who do not see may see and that those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, we are not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. Man, that's beautiful. Okay, let's go to it. So now what happens? Remember now, there's another thread. Remember the number of threads. The thread of the man who was born blind, the thread of the presentation that, that is with the people, because this was a witness to the people, this sign, but especially the thread of this witness to the religious leaders, namely the Pharisees, because this is a mi miracle only the Messiah could do. And what did Jesus say? The man was born blind so that I might do this at this time so that I might prove to all I am indeed the Messiah, son of God. But now let's go walk through the text. Remember, I've been telling you about this progression of faith of the man taking you now. What? To the very thing that he said about Jesus at the beginning, the man, the man who is called Jesus healed me. Then as going before the Pharisees in his interrogation, he called Jesus a prophet, not only a godly man, but a special man, a prophet. Now, notice, Jesus heard that they put the man out. So now the man has been officially excommunicated. He is no longer welcomed in the synagogue. But although he is not welcomed by the Pharisees, not welcome in their synagogues of worship, he is welcomed by Jesus. Jesus found him and said, notice the question, do you believe in the title son of man? Now let me calm down because I need to teach. Remember what I have been telling you. Always watch how Jesus uses the titles. The son of man titles refers to his humanity. The son of man refers to his humanity. And as son of man, humanity, he is giving a reference to him being the Messiah. We learned this from Daniel. But anyway, we're not going to get into all of that. But the Messiah. Do you believe that I am the Messiah? Do you believe this? Okay, but watch. And so the man answered Jesus, not recognizing 
Well, who is the Messiah? He says, who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? So the man shows a desire. I want to believe in the Messiah. Who is he? Who is he? Who is this one that healed me? Who is this one? Because the man cannot completely, perfectly identify Jesus. He needs clarification of Jesus as the Messiah. But now what I want you to understand is this. As he is speaking to Jesus, when he says, Lord, even though they capitalized it. Okay. And again, let me say without getting to a lot of details, when you see the writers, the word here is kurios, translated Lord. It can be translated Lord, master, or sir. Lord, when it says Lord, it means it is speaking of Jesus from the divine perspective. When they translate kurios, it is speaking of Jesus from the divine perspective, saying he is God. OK, this is the same way that they translate the personal name of God, Yahweh, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. When you see the Greek translation of Yahweh, capital, all caps, L-O-R-D, personal name of God, Yahweh, they translate it kurios. OK, this is how they translate. So. But curios can be translated Lord, name of God, master, it speaks for itself, like a slave owner, a great person, or sir, a title of great respect. Here, although they, the, the translators translated this word as Lord by the divine name and divine title of Jesus, they should not have because the man is not understanding who Jesus is at this time. He has not come to a complete identification of Jesus, the one who healed him, the one who healed him and the one that Jesus himself is Lord. He hadn't come to that identification. So it should rightly be translated, sir, sir, who is he, sir? that I may believe in him. So the man is putting forth the desire to Jesus. I want to believe in the Messiah. I just don't know who the Messiah is, who this one and in all and bringing together the one who also healed me. What does Jesus say? Jesus now gives him absolute clarity. Jesus said, you are both seeing him and it is the one that's talking to you. Now it's me. I am the son of man. I am the Messiah. Do you believe that I am the Messiah? Remember the whole issue is this man was born blind. Only the Messiah could heal him of his blindness. And Jesus has just healed him of that blindness. And Jesus is saying to this man, now by what has happened to you, do you believe I am the Messiah? Do you believe? Now watch the response of the man. Verse 38. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Okay, I'm not going to get excited, but I want you to see what's going on. Now the same word for Lord is used here. Kurios. And they translated it Lord, which is the name, the reference to Jesus as God. They translated it properly. Why? The man has, he, is, he now has clear identification. It is you, Jesus, who is the Messiah. You are the Messiah. And I believe you are the Messiah. But I am not referencing you as sir anymore. I was referencing you, sir, as a title of respect earlier because I didn't know. But now that you have told me who you are, I'm not calling you, sir. I am calling you God. How do we know that this is the proper translation of kurios, the address of Jesus as Lord by the title of God? Notice what he did when Jesus identified himself. He worshiped Jesus and I don't have to take you through. It is not even necessary. 
the countless number of scripture to the which you never give the glory of God to any man. You only worship God. You don't worship men. What did Peter say to, say to Cornelius? Stand up when Cornelius fell to his knees to worship Peter, Acts chapter 10. Peter said, I'm just a man like you. And what did John do to the angel who gave him the revelation from Christ? John fell at the feet of the angel and worshiped him. And what did the angel say? I am a fellow servant of Jesus like you. Worship God alone. You are only worship God. And what did this blind man do? He said, Lord, not the name sir anymore, but oh my God, Jesus, you indeed are Lord and God. And what did he do? He worshiped him because what? You only worship God. Again, what is the whole point? The theme of the gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, the word with God, the word was God, the word became flesh. The whole theme of God, Jesus is God. And what is John saying? I am going to show you through the text of scripture, through the life of Jesus, how indeed he truly is God. And this is what is going on here. And now what do you see? The final progression of faith. Isn't it a beautiful picture? The final understanding in this blind man. He goes from blindness to sight. Blindness to sight in his physical eyes. And blindness to sight in his spiritual eyes. And we see the progression. Who is he? He is the man, Jesus. Who is he? He is a prophet. Who is he? You are God. Indeed, now he is. Sees. What does Jesus say? And except you acknowledge that I am God, you will die in your sins. Man, that's just something else. But so he worshiped him. So what do we see? We see the progression of faith, right? On the counter side to the progression of faith. We see the obstinance of ignorance. We see those who remain in ignorance. We see those who continue to reject the person that he is God, that he is man, son of God, son of man. We see those who continue in their hard heartedness and their rebellion and rejection of Jesus. And so what happens? Jesus responds. But notice something. I want to say, oh, my goodness, I almost forgot that. Notice the worshiping any Jew would see by the man worshiping Jesus that they are considering him to be God. Whoever's doing so, this is obeisance to one who is God. OK, notice Jesus received this worship. Did you get that? Jesus did not tell the man, stop that. Don't do that. I'm not God. Only worship God because that's what everybody else in scripture says. Everybody, men, angels, everybody else, right? Jesus does not prohibit the man from worshiping him. He receives it. So imagine the man probably grabbing Jesus' feet, bowed down on the dirt of the ground. And Jesus stands there and he allows this to take place. Why? He is who he says that he is. And he is God Almighty. He is the creator. He is the one who stooped down to the earth in the very beginning and from the clay of the ground made Adam. He is that one who took his spittle and stooped down to the ground and made clay and made eyes for this man. He is. Doggone it, that's who he is. Okay, enough of that because I don't want to get emotional and excited. So what does Jesus do? He continues on now to speak to those who Rejects him for judgment. I've come into this world so that those who see who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Now, it seems a little convoluted in the terminology that he's using, but he's making a strong point for judgment. Now, he's not talking about the final judgment. He's talking about to make a, a point of division 
to make a, a, a because of me coming into this world is going to be a clear division between those who see and those who do not see. By what does he mean? To make a point of judgment between those who do not see and those who see those who do not see. Notice those who do not see so that they may see those who do see so that they will be made blind. So those who do not see it go. It takes us all the way back to Matthew chapter five. Remember the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. They'll be filled. Blessed are those who understand that they have a spiritual need. Blessed are those who understand that of themselves, they are not able to enter into the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who understand that they are sinners, completely unable to do anything that pleases God. Blessed are they who recognize that in me alone, that I am the God who comes to save, that I am the son of man who gives my life on the cross for their sins. Blessed are they who have come to the realization that I have to depend completely upon Jesus and what he has done for me in order to gain salvation, in order to be pleasing with God. Of myself, I can do nothing. I am a sinner sold unto sin. And except Jesus should purchase my soul, I will remain in sin. Blessed are they who understand the absolute need and dependence on me. They are blind. And when they are blind, recognizing their uh, 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 inability, recognizing their impotence, they are able to see. I will enable them to see. I will open their eyes. I will save them. Because they recognize that they have a need and that need can only be satisfied in me alone. Blessed are they. They are blind. They are blind. They recognize their need and they come to me and I make them see. I give them salvation, says Jesus. And then on the other side, but those who claim that they see. Those who think they don't need me, those who think they know the way, those who think of themselves and of their own righteousness and those who believe by what they do, they can enter into the kingdom of God, that they can have favor with God the Father apart from believing in me, apart from believing that I am the son of God, that I am divine, apart from believing that I came in human flesh to offer salvation for their sins, paying for them. Suffering the curse of God. Cursed is he who hangs on a tree. They don't believe that. They think they already see. And they think that of themselves they are able. And you know what they do? They ultimately reject me. And those who think that they see. This is now the judgment. You are really blind. For without me. You have nothing. You are nothing and you can do nothing. You think you see, but in reality, you are spiritually blind. Now, there were Pharisees who were with Jesus at that time when he spoke these words and they kind of understood what Jesus was trying to say, but they didn't understand it properly. They thought Jesus was saying that they were blind and so they took it negatively, not understanding that Jesus was simply saying, if, if you were blind, I could help you. But they said to Jesus, are we now blind? Are you trying to call us blind? Are you trying to say we don't know? Are you trying to say that we're not right with God? Are you trying to say something's wrong with us? Are we blind? And Jesus simply responds and says, no, that's the problem. That's the problem. Because if you were blind, I could make you see. If you realized and if you acknowledge 
You are not right with God. You don't know everything and that you do lack and that you do need the Messiah. You need me. You understand who I am and what I am going to do. If indeed you were blind, I could make you see. I could help you to see. I could save your soul. But the problem is you think you see. You think you know it all. You think you're in good shape with God and you think you are righteous. And in all of that, you reject me. And since you think that you see, your sin remain. Why? It is the Messiah. He is the only one who could take away sin. And your problem is you reject me as the Messiah, as the son of God. And therefore your sins remain. And we can all see, see Jesus saying in a sense, I would that you were blind. Then I could help you. But the problem is I can't help you because you think you're already in good shape. And let me do a little preaching on that. And that's the problem that I see with so many people, especially I'm going to end it out here, especially when it comes to the scripture. I hear people say, you don't have to go to church and you don't need no preacher and I can learn the Bible for myself. People think, and I see it all the time, and they try to be teachers. And that's the thing that really gets my goat. When you have unlearned people and people who don't even have a true relationship with God and people who understand the absolute need and dependence on God, people who don't understand that I am a tool in the hand of God, people who are proud and arrogant, who think they see that irritates the devil out of me. Why? Because if truly you truly understood who you were, then God could help you. And these are the main people you can't tell a doggone thing. They think they know everything. They think they have seen everything. And let me tell you something. When it comes to the Bible, they I'd have read the Bible two or three times. And just like the eunuch, you don't even understand what you read. You have to be blind. You have to approach God with a spirit of humility. You have to say unto God, how will I know except some man should teach me, except God should open my eyes. I am blind. I can't do anything. I am nothing. I need you, Lord, and I need the things that you have supplied for my edification, for my building up, and even Jesus for my salvation. We have to get off of our pompous, proud high horse and let somebody tell you something sometime because you don't know everything. None of us do. Not me, myself, none of us do. But admit to God. I am blind and God will make you see. All right, enough of that. I know it was a long time, but what did we see? We saw a pro progression of faith. So many wonderful threads, didn't we? We saw a man who didn't know Jesus, who just simply thought of him as a man. But by the grace and spirit of God, his understanding of Jesus was made clear. He saw Jesus as a man. He moved from a man to the thought of him being a prophet. And ultimately, he moved to him being God in the flesh. How do we know? He worshiped him. He worshiped him. Something that you only do for God. And then what did we see? We saw those who continued in their rebellion, rejection, and obstinance. They rejected Jesus from the beginning. They tried to reject the miracle. They tried to reject the man, reject the parent. Ultimately, they rejected Jesus. And Jesus said, you know what the problem is? You are blind. You are blind in your rejection and in your obstinance. So therefore, because you reject me, your sin remain. And so we saw this continual theme, not only of blindness in the eyes of the man that was born blind, we saw that continual theme to the end of John 9 of spiritual blindness. One who understood he was blind was made to see. Another who thought he was righteous of himself, the Pharisees, remained truly blind. All right, guys, thanks for joining me with all of that. Join me next time as we get into chapter number 10 and we deal with some of the parables of Jesus as being the good shepherd and the door unto the sheep. 
But anyway, if you can say, Pastor Lee, these lessons have blessed me and God has moved your heart to bless and support this ministry. There is a link in the description that you can use to support this ministry. And I'm asking you to please partner with me in doing so. But enough of all of that. God bless you and see you next time.